So what I'm going to be speaking about today is the hidden yoga of the Upanishads. The hidden yoga of the Upanishads. Well, first let me explain this title itself a little bit. First of all, what are the Upanishads? I'm sure many people here have heard this term before. Many of them know what this term actually means. But for those who don't, let me explain. First, let me explain by asking a question. Who here is a yogi? Just raise your hand. Meaning, who here loves yoga, has done yoga, has benefited from yoga? Very good. Pretty much everyone here has raised their hand. Well, yoga itself is a tradition that has a history that is so rich, that is so profound, that is so ancient, that the moment that you begin to uncover this history, the moment that you begin to read about what precisely is yoga, not simply the asanas, you know, we just did almost two hours of asana, we know the asanas are powerful, we know that they are wonderful. But the thing that is amazing is when we discover that the asanas themselves actually are just literally the little tip of the iceberg of what is yoga. Again, this is a tradition that is so ancient, so rich, so profound that truthfully, if we decide in our own life to take yoga seriously and to truly devote ourselves to it, we can study yoga and every aspect of yoga for the rest of our lives and even then not exhaust everything that is there. Now, yoga itself is based upon teachings themselves that are extremely ancient and those teachings are found in a set of texts, a set of scriptures. Generally speaking, these are known as the Vedas, the Vedic liter literature, Shastra, many different terms for these works. These works themselves, these books are vast. A few of them I'm sure we've heard of. We've heard of Yoga Sutras, for example, written by Patanjali. We've heard of Bhagavad Gita, and then maybe a few others, maybe Vedas themselves, but Truthfully, there are hundreds and hundreds of books that serve as the philosophical basis and foundation of yoga. Among these books are a collection of books known as the Upanishads. And there are quite a few of these. Again, we're talking about a vast literature, not just like two or three books. The Upanishads are just one genre of all of these books, and there are 108 Upanishads really a vast library. Some of these Upanishads are very short. Some of them are as short as, I believe the shortest one is about 19 verses long. Very, very short. Some of them are very big. Uh, Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad, for example, in translation, ends up being a very thick book. Now, why are these books specifically, the Upanishads, so important? Because it's been recognized all throughout the yoga tradition, but also other allied traditions that the foundation of Vedic wisdom, yogic wisdom, is found in these books. Well, why are they so important? Well, precisely this. Everything that we wish to know about things of importance, that is, the philosophical questions. Who are we? Not just who are we when we look in the mirror, not just who are we, meaning we can take out our driver's license and show a few little facts and figures and stats about ourselves. No. Who are we truly in the deepest essence of who we are? When we close our eyes and we lose sight of the fact that we have a body, that we even have a face, when we still the mind and all that chattering comes to a place of calm and peace, who are we really when we turn within? This is a very important question. The Upanishads discuss this and give us answers. What is the nature when we then open our eyes of this world that is around us, of everything that we see, everything we experience, all the other living beings, etc.? What is it all? What's it all about? And then finally, the divine, our source, our origin, what in the Western world we often call God. Is there a God? What is the nature of God? And going very deeply into precisely what is the nature of this absolute. These are some of the topics that the Upanishads talk about. And again, very, very deeply. The Upanishads themselves exist in the form of dialogues, interestingly. Wonderful dialogues, mostly between gurus, 
individuals who are enlightened beings and their disciples who will come to them and ask many of these questions. And then these gurus will answer these questions in a very authoritative way, not due to speculation, but they answer the questions as a result of their own experience, their own realization. They themselves having practiced meditation and yoga for, in many cases, decades and decades, and having very deep realizations about indeed what is the meaning of life. So the Upanishads consist of these dialogues, these discussions. For those of you who haven't had a chance to read the Upanishads yet, please take a look at them when you have a chance. There are many translations. Just go to a good bookstore if they don't have them there, which they should. But if they don't have translations there, just special order them. Of course, there's Amazon. You get anything on, on Amazon, as we know. Just look up Upanishads. Take a look at these when you have a chance. All right. Now, all that being said, generally speaking, there are three approaches to knowing precisely what I was talking about. Ourselves, the divine, the meaning of life, etc. These three ways of knowing are first yoga itself, but then also Vedanta, and Vedanta is a very philosophical approach to wanting to know the nature of the absolute. And then finally, what is called bhakti or devotion. Now, this is something that is very interesting that I have to point out. And those people who are very familiar with these terms especially will hopefully appreciate this. Those who aren't, please bear with my talk and this will all make complete sense. Unfortunately, for all too long, many people see these three paths, yoga, Vedanta, and bhakti or devotion as being separate paths. That is, you either want to delve very deeply into practice, practice, practice. So you do yoga. Or you're very philosophical. You want to engage in philosophy using logic, using reason, intuitive insight, etc., and try to understand what is the nature of our reality. Or you want to be very devotionally oriented and surrender yourself to the absolute. Again, too many people see these three paths as three separate paths, indeed. Actually, the Upanishads teach us, and this entire tradition teaches us, that all three of those are one path. They are actually the same. For an individual who wishes to know who they are, self-realization, and who wants to know the nature of the divine, God-realization, we ultimately have to practice all three. That is, of course we have to be philosophical. What does it mean to search for truth but not be philosophical? You know, we can't know the truth simply by sentiment, simply by wishing. No, we of course have to inquire in an intelligent way and we have to have the discernment to understand when we're given answers whether those answers are right or, right or wrong. So of course we have to be philosophical, thus Vedanta. At the same time, what does it mean to be merely philosophical without actually putting spirituality into practice? then you're simply an armchair philosopher, just kind of sitting and speculating but not doing anything. Spirituality is doing, spirituality is living. Thus, yoga is the heart of our practice. So, we are philosophical, we do, we do yoga, we do meditation, we do what is called sadhana, that is, the spiritual disciplines that are necessary to refine our character, to give clarity to our mind and to make slow advancement toward the absolute. And then finally, doing those two things, the foundation of all spirituality at all times is bhakti, is devotion. Because what is the nature of devotion? It's love. Love. What does it mean to be a so-called spiritual person but not love? It's an oxymoron. There is no such thing as being spiritual and yet you do not love, and yet you do not have devotion. Because what devotion in the highest sense means is that you willingly, of your own accord, are choosing to give yourself to the divine with an open heart, with trust, with faith, and to engage in reciprocal loving relationship, a communing with the divine. This is what so many spiritual traditions, practiced in their authentic form, of course, explain to us. This is the meaning of life, ultimately, to have so intimate 
a communing with the divine such that while still retaining who we are, we don't lose our identity, but in a way we lose ourselves in the divine in the same way that we lose ourselves in our beloved. If you've ever been in love, you know what this is like. You don't lose your identity, you're still you. But you so love that person to the point where, really, in a way, all that there is is them. But you're still you. But all that there is is them. You see? That's the ultimate goal of spirituality, is to have such a perfect, loving communion with that loving being who is our source. So, all three of these paths, the philosophical, Vedanta, the practical, practice, yoga, and ultimately, devotion or bhakti, they are one, they are the same. And all three of these are found in the Upanishads. Truthfully, if we had the time, very easily we could do a series meeting every day for an hour and a half, seven days a week, for probably about half a year and explore these three themes in the Upanishads. That's how much these three themes are of importance to the Upanishads. And even then, we would only be scratching the surface. <laughs> so, all right, all that being said, I have to edit myself because as I said, you know, we do want to break for lunch. So, just a few more things that I want to say. Yoga itself, interestingly, has its foundation in the Upanishads. And again, this is something that, for those individuals who have heard of the Upanishads, many people are not aware of this. People tend to uh, associate yoga with the Yoga Sutras. For those who are a little bit not more knowledgeable, the Bhagavad Gita, because the Bhagavad Gita also is a yoga text. But more than anything, actually, the entire yoga system in its authentic and full form is indeed found in these 108 books known as the Upanishads. In the Upanishads, a very specific term is used for this practice of yoga. This term is Upasana. Upasana. So, Savitri Devi just taught an almost two-hour two long class on something called Upasana Yoga. And this is a sequence that is based upon these teachings. But Upasana as an actual path, a philosophical path, a path of meditation, a path of yoga, is actually found all throughout the Upanishads. It's interesting how you will encounter this interesting word, Upasana, again and again and again, if you read the Upanishads, and especially if you read the Sanskrit in the Upanishads. Yet, interestingly, be honest, let me ask people here, other than my, in, my speaking about this, not just here, but previous seminars and conferences that we've had here at Eastside Yoga, who here has heard this word, Upasana, before I introduced it to people and revealed it to people? Please raise your hand. Very interesting. Almost no one has heard this word, and yet I've read all the Upanishads in Sanskrit. I've even translated several of them into English from the Sanskrit. You find this word again and again and again and again throughout the Upanishads, Upasana. Now, what does this word mean? Yeah, here's a hint, Upanishad, Upasana. You see how the word almost sounds exactly the same, because it has the same verb root, actually. It comes from the same source. The words are similar because they, in a way, do mean the same thing. So, Upanishad, Upanishad, Shad, Shat, means to sit. Upanishad means to sit near the Guru. That's what the word Upanishad means. And again, why? Because remember I described how the Upanishads consist of discussions of people going to a Guru, they sit next to the Guru, they ask questions. So the very word for this literature is to sit next to, to sit near. And thus, we understand, to sit near the Guru and get answers. So that's Upanishad. Now, upasana means something very similar. Upasana, and I've translated it this way. I found that this is the best translation. No one else has translated this, this word in this manner other than me. Upasana means proximity. That is, being close to. Being close to. 
Now, what is meant by this, being close to? Well, what is it that we're seeking spiritually? Interestingly, even intuitively, many of us understand this. We are seeking proximity. We are seeking unity. We are seeking harmony. We are seeking closeness to. Closeness to what? Closeness to our source. Closeness to truth. Closeness to, again, the divine, to God. It is, in fact, by that proximity, by approaching and being close to God, that we then begin to become like unto that. So, this is the example that's given, and it's a very nice example. Imagine that you have a roaring fire, okay? And we all know the properties of fire. And if you were to take a, let's say, steel bar, and you put, you put it in that fire, you place it in the fire, you leave it in there for five minutes, 10 minutes. What begins to happen to that steel bar? Because of its proximity to the fire, it begins to become like that fire. It begins to glow. It glows red. It begins to look like fire. If you take it out of the fire and now you touch it to some paper, what will happen to that paper? It will burn. Now, the steel rod is still a steel rod. It's not fire, but it has become like unto fire. Okay? Proximity. In the same way, this is what we wish to do. By having proximity to God in meditation, in yoga, in our sadhana, the spiritual practices that we do. In the same way that, what is God? <laughs> Million dollar question. God is the source of infinite auspicious attributes. That is, God is the source of infinite goodness, of infinite beauty, of infinite wisdom, of infinite light, of infinite fill in the blank, any auspicious, wonderful, positive quality that you can think of. God not only possesses that quality to an infinite degree, but even more so, God is the very source of that quality. When we have communion with such a being, with the divine, what happens to us? See, this is meditation. Meditation is not just a little relaxation exercise to de-stress yourself because you've had a very busy day. It does that too. But this is meditation. Communing with the divine such that we become like that iron rod and we begin to see our true selves and how we are beautiful. We are good. We are light. We are wise. We are all of these things in our true being. Thus, upasana proximity to the divine. Very good. So, and please believe me, I'm editing myself <laughs> to make this talk a little bit shorter. But just a few more things I want to say. And that is this, Patanjali. When we think of yoga, we tend to think of Patanjali and the Yoga Sutras, and for very good reasons. Uh, the Yoga Sutras is indeed a scriptural foundation, a textual foundation for yoga. There is tremendous wisdom, tremendous insight that is there in the Yoga Sutras, and specifically about meditation as well. Tremendous insight. However, people who are scholars on Patanjali have all said, and I'm sure many people here know, that of course Patanjali was not the founder of yoga. He never claimed to be the founder of yoga. All of his teachings go back thousands and thousands of years before him, and indeed they are found in the Upanishads. His teachings are based upon the Upanishads, so much so that if you understand which Upanishads to look at, and they tend to be the ones that are not quite as well known in the West, you find almost exact parallels. And what I want to talk about just very briefly is just one of these Upanishads, one that, again, almost no one has heard of. It's there, it's, you can read it in translation, but it's one of the lesser known ones. It's known as the Shandilya Upanishad. Shandilya Upanishad. And it's not a very long Upanishad. You could read this in maybe 20 minutes or so, so it's not a very long work. But what is amazing is, what it describes is indeed Ashtanga Yoga, Patanjali Yoga, Raja Yoga, whatever name you want to give it. And it so well parallels Patanjali that it's absolutely amazing. Except even better, it goes even deeper than Patanjali. It gives specifics. 
tremendous specifics. See, Patanjali wrote in such a way that he wrote in code. He wrote very brief little aphorisms. And then you need to interpret them and understand them. What's wonderful about this work, which again, very few people, will, very few people have heard of, is that it's almost like another Yoga Sutras, except it's longer, and it goes very deep into detail. So much so that there are um, eight asanas that are considered to be the most important in this book. And again, he describes it in very great detail. This wonderful sage known as Shandilya. And in fact, I want to just read one very quick verse from the Shandilya Upanishad and compare it to a very famous book from Patanjali. And this is just by way of example. Truthfully, there are so many parallels that I could do this with many verses. But just to give you a little bit of an idea of how Patanjali, he got his ideas indeed from the Upanishads. So this is the Shandilya Upanishad, chapter 1, verse 42. When the modifications of the mind are stilled, the mind verily obtains peace. All right? When the modifications of the mind are stilled. For those who know the Yoga Sutras, okay, chapter 1, verse 2 in the Yoga Sutras, Yoga Shchitta Vritti Nirodhaha. What's, in the pro what's the translation of that, someone? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yoga is the stilling of the modifications of the mind. This is Patanjali saying this, so exactly the same thing. So fascinating, absolutely fascinating. So what I want to do now is just read, and again, due to lack of time, I was actually hoping to comment on several verses from the Shandilya Upanishad, but instead I just want to, I just want to focus on one, and that is the object of meditation. In the Shandilya Upanishad, he goes very, very deeply into what is the process of meditation, the psychology of the mind, what the mind goes through in meditation, etc. But rather than talking about all that, because truthfully, there are several ways in which you can learn the deeper aspects of meditation. What I want to do is just read one verse and that is chapter 1, verse 55 of the Shandile Upanishad, where he talks about what is the object of meditation. And he uses the name Vishnu here. Vishnu in Sanskrit is one of the names of God. So he's talking about the divine, about God. And this is what Shandilya says. And it's, I love this verse. It's interesting. It's kind of tricky. One should not worship Vishnu, that is God, during the day alone. One should not worship Vishnu during the night alone. But one should always worship Vishnu and should not worship him merely during day and night. Interesting verse. So, I just want to comment on this a little bit because it's extremely profound. So, we should not meditate on God during the day alone. We should not meditate on God during the night alone. Thus, the idea is to meditate on the divine. And what is meant by meditate on the divine? Because obviously, who can sit in stillness in meditation what he is saying, quite literally 24 hours a day? No one. Of course, what he is speaking of is something deeper. He's talking about a living meditation. He's talking about what technically is called Brahma Vidya, that is, God consciousness. You see, we all have an idea, an inkling of what meditation means. You know, again, we have the idea, oh, well, you sit in meditation and you purposefully focus the, the mind on the spiritual, focus the mind on your Atman, on your true self, and then on Paramatman, on the Supreme Self, on God. But then eventually you open your eyes and you go on with your day. And that is meditation. It's true. That is meditation in practice. However, this is what's interesting. For most of us, when we think of meditation, we think of meditation as something we do, and then when it's over, then we get back to what? Our real life, right? No. If we want to truly understand and experience the depth of meditation, we need to see this the other way around. 
It is when we are in that state of calm and stillness and going within and feeling that inner bliss in which we feel as if we are quite literally touching eternality and it is a feeling so familiar, so, so familiar to us that we know just how real this is. It is at that time that, we'll, that we are in the real world. Then sadly we have to open our eyes and face this. <laughs> The goal of meditation, what we could call enlightenment, what we could call liberation, moksha, so many different words, is this, to come to that stage in which we are experiencing the deepest aspect of meditation. We are experiencing such profound peace, such profound joy, such profound clarity of inner vision that we cannot even believe that there is anything greater, but it doesn't end and we can open our eyes and we can get in our car and drive to our destination and we can go shopping and we can cook food and we can have conversations and we can be at work and we can read a book and we can do all the things of this world but at all times still we are in that state of absolute calm and absorption in the divine. This is what Shandilya is talking about when he says that what is meditation? It means that you are worshiping or you are focused upon the divine all the day and all the night. All right? We understand that, to experience this state 24 hours a day. But then, even with that profundity, he says something else, which is kind of puzzling. How does he end this, what we just said? But one should always worship him and not worship him merely during the day and night. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> That's all there is. There's day and there's night. There's day. What does he mean by this? Yes, you should worship him all throughout the day. Focus your awareness on the divine. All throughout the day. Focus your awareness on the divine. All throughout the night. However, you should focus on the divine not merely in the day or the night. <laughs> is that puzzling? What is he talking about? What is he speaking about? We need to meditate on the divine in a way that is so transcendent that while being rooted in this world in which indeed there is day, there is night, there is that cycle and all the cycles and all the dualities that we know are present here within this world, but ultimately what is he saying? We must focus on the divine in such a manner that we transcend even duality, that we transcend even the cycles that we're accustomed to. The idea that ultimately our goal is to be situated in transcendence in the spiritual realm, in the presence of the divine in such a way that there isn't even day or night anymore. There's simply bliss. And duality itself has ceased. How profound is this? This is only one verse that I had time to <laughs> share with you and comment on. Again, so many verses like this. In this one Upanishad, and there are 108 such Upanishads. This is their profundity. They're all like this. So wonderful. This is the hidden yoga of the Upanishads. The goal being, indeed, to achieve this state that I mentioned a state in which we are in the world but not of the world. Oh, we can do everything in this world and we can have radical success. I, I got a PhD. <laughs> we can do anything. We can, we can become extremely educated. We can become doctors. We can, we can have wealth. We can have a nice home, nice car, wonderful family, etc. And on the contrary, in fact, my students will tell you, I encourage them to make sure that they get an education, make sure that they're doing well materially. We can be in the world, but not of the world. We can be like the lotus flower. Why is the lotus flower the symbol of enlightenment? Well, it's rooted in murky waters. Just like we are rooted in this world, which is often very murky. <laughs> but what does the lotus flower do? It rises above those murky waters. It transcends it. It is of those murky waters but it's not. 
and it blossoms to show its beauty to the world. Let us be like those lotus flowers. Very good.